Thank you for that beautiful reminder. Uh, and as we do, as we continue to prepare our hearts to receive the word of the Lord this morning, uh, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Let's pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and you are our redeemer. And all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. I have a word I want to show you this morning. Uh, it's one you see in the sermon title, and it's one that you're probably familiar with. And it's the word identifier. A person or place that identifies someone. Identifier. An identifier, uh, a person or place that identifies someone. Another way you can think of this is, is a label that, that somebody gives to you. Uh, it's another word for what they are. We all have identifiers that we carry around with us. Uh, for instance, many of you, not all of you, but many of you call me Pastor Marcus. Okay? Uh, that word pastor is an identifier. It identifies something about who I am. Uh, it identifies something about our relationship. And, and it's an identifier that you give to me. Uh, now, not everybody calls me Pastor Marcus, right? Evelyn, my daughter, when I talk to her, she doesn't say, oh, good morning, Pastor Dad, or good morning, Pastor Marcus, right? She just calls me Dad. And that's another identifier that I have. That's another name that indicates my relationship with Evelyn. And we all carry these around with us, right? Uh, think of some of yours, right? Teacher, student, mom, dad, husband, wife, aunt, uncle, uh, retired, farmer, whatever it is, right? Fill in the blank. We all have these identifiers that we carry with us. And most of the time, uh, they're, they're good and they're fine, right? For you to call me pastor, for everyone to call me dad, uh, for me to be husband or uncle or anything like that, those are good things. Those are good identifiers. But I think we also carry around identifiers that, that aren't so good, right? Maybe we carry these these myths about uh, who we are that have been told to us over the years, right? Maybe you carry the myth that uh, you're not smart enough, right? Maybe you were told that a couple times in your life, and that all of a sudden becomes a part of who you are, becomes an identifier. Maybe you were told that you were never quite good enough to be a part of this or a part of that. Maybe you're told you don't have quite enough money, or you don't have quite enough friends. Maybe that's an identifier that you carry with you. I want to ask you, just a second, to, to actually think of some of these identifiers that you carry for yourself, the good and the bad. What are some things that, that have been given to you, a person or a place that identifies someone? What are some things about you that you carry with you that make up a part of your identity? And as you spend just a moment kind of getting some of those actually in your brain, uh, I want those to be rolling around in your head as we read our scripture for this morning. Uh, this morning we're going to read the story of Jesus' baptism as it's told in the Gospel of Luke. And, and it's a shorter telling uh, than some of the other Gospels. It's not quite as long of a baptism story uh, as there are in other places, but it shows us something beautiful about who God is. So uh, you are invited to turn to Luke chapter 3. Verses 15 to 22. And let these identifiers that you have for yourself roll around in your head as you listen to these verses. Luke chapter 3, verses 15 to 22. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because of Herodias, his brother's wife, 
and all the other evil things he had done, Herod, Herod added this to them. He locked John up in prison. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, <coughs> heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. People of God, this is the word of the Lord. Jesus. Jesus' baptism marks the beginning of his public ministry. If we were to go back in the Gospel of Luke, so far we've heard uh, in the first chapter this anticipation for Jesus' birth. Uh, in Luke 2, we hear the story of Jesus' birth, the shepherds and the angels and all that. Uh, then uh, we hear about uh, John the Baptist preparing the way. And finally, here at the end of chapter 3, we hear about his baptism. And all of this is going to lead into the rest of Jesus' ministry. Uh, the next verse, actually, verse 23, tells us that he was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. And it might seem a little strange, right? In the midst of this whole big story of Jesus, the whole story that Luke is telling in his gospel, for Jesus to be baptized. Have you ever thought about this? That, that might seem a little strange. When Christians talk about baptism, historically, when we've talked about baptism, we often use the image uh, of dying to sin and rising again to new life. Right? It signifies the new life that we receive in Jesus Christ. Now, that wasn't really necessary for Jesus, was it? Jesus didn't have this old life of sin to die to. So what's going on here? Uh, why is this story even here? Why does Luke find it important to tell us that Jesus was baptized? There's uh, two things that I want us to reflect on this morning. Two things that I think are happening in this story that I think are really meaningful and really important for us. The first is this. Jesus is identifying himself with sinners. Now, I want to be clear. He's not identifying himself as a sinner. He's identifying himself with sinners. I think many of us often operate with this, uh, this understanding of God. And I don't know where it comes from, but we have this understanding of God, that God is standing far away, that God is far off, uh, that God is looking at us and waiting for us to mess up uh, so he can bring down his mighty wrath upon us or whatever it might be. Or maybe he's just looking down with a disapproving look, right? Noise has a scowl on his face, right? I think we have this image of God that says God is far away, waiting for us to mess up. And if we mess up, oh boy, look out, right? But Jesus here in his baptism shows us a completely different image of God. He isn't far away from sinners. Guess where he is? He's in line right with them. As all these sinners are gathered, wanting to seek the grace and the forgiveness of God, wanting to repent and return and turn their lives around. As sinners are gathered there, Jesus is right there in line with them, saying, here I am. I'm not far away. I'm not way out there somewhere. I am right here with you. Jesus isn't far away from sinners waiting to bring them punishment. Jesus is standing in line with them, leading them to the waters of grace. How much would our lives change if that was our dominant image of God? Instead of being far away, that we saw God as being right next to us, leading us to the waters of grace. This is consistently what Jesus is doing, not just here in his baptism, but all throughout the Gospels. Later in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 19, Jesus says this, he says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Seek and to save the lost, right? The sinners. He identifies again with the sinners. And then in Luke chapter 5, uh, just a couple of chapters ahead of where we are today, Jesus uh, goes and he calls Levi a tax collector. Okay, tax collectors were, were sinners of the day, were, were really seen as just kind of the lowest of the low kind of people. Jesus goes to Levi, this tax collector, and he says, follow me, be my disciple. 
And Levi immediately drops everything and says, yes, I will follow you. And after that, Levi throws this big banquet at his house for Jesus. And he invites all of these other tax collectors. And Jesus goes. Uh, and then all of a sudden we have the Pharisees. Or the religious elite of the time, right? The, the upstanding church members of the time. And they look at Jesus and they say, why does he eat and drink with, this, with these tax collectors and sinners? Right? They're saying, how can Jesus possibly associate with those kind of people? Right? That's the tone that they have going on. And Jesus says this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Over and over and over again, Jesus identifies himself with sinners. He stands with them. He walks in line with them to the waters of baptism. He eats with them. He calls them to follow him. Calls them to repentance. Leads them to grace. People of God, this is good news, isn't it? What if we just acknowledged and realized a few minutes ago in our worship service that we are sinners? Right? That we are all sinners in need of grace. And the good news is that God is not far off. That Jesus is here with us. That Jesus stands with us. He doesn't wait far away, waiting for us to mess up, waiting for us to just step one toe out of line so he can strike us with his divine lightning and wrath. He walks with us. And he eats with us. And he leads us to the waters of grace. In his baptism, we see Jesus standing with sinners. And identifying with sinners. And all that leads to the second thing I want us to know this morning. Not only does Jesus identify himself with sinners, but Jesus is identified by God the Father. Jesus receives identifiers. He receives names. He receives descriptions from God the Father. He's baptized and he's praying. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes from heaven in bodily form like a dove. Uh, and a voice from heaven says, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Jesus receives identity. He is identified by God the Father as son, as beloved, as well pleased with. These are things that God gives to him. And they are powerful, powerful Truths, okay? Let's walk through these. The first one he receives is the, the identifier of son. God the Father looks at Jesus and he says, You are my son. He doesn't disown him. He doesn't push him far away. He says, You are my son. You belong to me. Calling somebody a son indicates a close relationship, indicates a familial, unbreakable relationship. Jesus is identified as son. Then, the next one, whom I love. Uh, it's, this is an adjective. It's translated differently. It's kind of one word. But this is an adjective, beloved. Uh, it's translated in other places. It's an adjective that literally means dearly loved. Okay? You can, you can, translate, you can put that in there, right? Beloved, dearly loved, whatever it might be. Jesus is identified as a recipient of love. Isn't that beautiful? A recipient of love. You're my son. And not just my son because you have to be. right? You're my son whom I love. You're my beloved one. With you, I am well pleased. You ever heard somebody say, uh, I love you, but I don't really like you? <laughs> right? Maybe we've said that to people in our family or people in our lives before. And this is the true thing, right? You can love someone, but not really like them. Right? This is God the Father saying to Jesus, I love you, and I like you. I delight in you. With you, I am well pleased. It's a father saying to his son, you bring me great joy. I delight in your presence. I delight in who you are. I delight in my relationship with you. <coughs> God doesn't call Jesus just out of obligation. He delights in him with Jesus, he is well pleased. These are the identifiers, okay, that Jesus receives in what must have been an awe-inspiring and amazing moment in his life. 
And remember, uh, this, is, this is important too, remember where we are in this gospel. Is, is this baptism at the beginning or the end of his ministry? Who was listening? Beginning or end? Beginning, right? We are just at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. God the Father is giving Jesus these identifiers right at the outset, right at the beginning of everything. Notice God the Father didn't wait until Jesus had gone through three years of ministry and gone through this long and arduous process and finally said, all right, now you are worthy to be called my son. Now you are worthy to be my beloved. Now with you I am well pleased because you have done all of this for me. No, right? Jesus, ministry-wise speaking, hasn't done anything yet. At the outset, at the beginning, before Jesus has earned it or anything like that, God reaches into his life and he says, You are my son. You belong to me. You are my beloved. With you I am well pleased. I delight in you. Jesus doesn't have to earn these titles with God the Father. He has simply given them as a gift. What a powerful testimony to the love of God. Amen? Friends of Christ, these identifiers that Jesus received as he stood with sinners speak to the great love of God. They speak to the great movement of God into our lives. And do you know something else this morning? All of these identifiers that Jesus has received, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased and delight in you. All of these identifiers that Jesus has received, all of this love that was poured out on him before he began his ministry, before he started that long three-year journey, all of these identifiers, friends, are for us this morning as well. And if you're thinking to yourself, ah, no, Marcus, those are for Jesus. Those can't possibly be for me. Let's listen to what our scriptures tell us. Galatians 4 says this. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. And that word sonship there, uh, it isn't meant to be uh, gender specific. It, it's meant to reference the fact that in the ancient Near East world, sons received all the inheritance, right? They received all the rights of their fathers. So when Paul talks about sonship here, he's not just talking about it being for men. He's talking about all of us who find ourselves in Christ Jesus having full rights as heirs of Christ. And we'll get to that, right? Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you, okay, you, you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. All the blessings, all the identifiers, all the promises that were poured out on Jesus Christ are poured out onto us as well. In Jesus Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God. We have been welcomed in as full sons and daughters, as heirs and co-heirs with Christ. All of the promises and all of the love and all of the glory uh, that God bestows upon the Son, He bestows to us as well. When we find ourselves in Christ, friends, we share in this love. In Christ, we are called sons daughters. We are made part of a family. In Christ, we are called beloved. Okay? You are, are literally worthy of love, the recipient of love. And that's enough. In Christ, uh, we are called uh, well-pleased with, right? Delighted in. God delights in us, his children. And all of this promise and all of this good news is ours, even as we gather here today as sinners. As we stand uh, with those who are with Jesus going to get baptized, God joins us right here. He speaks blessing into our lives and he leads us to the waters of grace. <laughs> the love of Jesus breaks into our lives, friends, and gives us a new identity. We carry new identifiers with us. The identifier I want you to take with you today, tomorrow, and every day is this one. It's the same one that Christy gave to the kids. 
you are beloved. Okay? Did you hear me? If you tuned out, I want you to listen again, okay? You are beloved. Amen and hallelujah. You are dearly loved. You, friends. Some of us, some of us hesitate to claim this identity for our own. Some of us say, no, but I, I haven't done enough yet. Some of us say, no, but Jesus, you don't understand. Like, I do this in the week, and I do this, and I mess up here, and I mess up there. Guess what? Jesus knows it all. He knows it all. He knows everything about you. He knows everything that goes on with you. And still, His grace looks at you and says, you are beloved. You are dearly loved. You are worthy of my love. People of God, this is the good news of Jesus Christ. And we have a chance this morning to taste a little bit of that love here at the table. As we receive communion, this is a sign and a seal uh, of God's eternal covenant of grace with us. When we talk about communion here, we talk about it as being a time to remember what God has done for us, as being a time to, to commune with the living Christ, and being a time to remember the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. But when we come to the table, there's this this past, present, and future dimension to it. And in some mysterious, lovely, beautiful way, Christ tells us through this bread and through this cup that we are loved. That we are worthy of that love. He gives us the name and the identifier, beloved. 